Um, this is Kristen, and I'm going to talk about the state of the poultry litter and nutrients. And in particular, we're focusing on, um, from an environmental perspective, nitrogen and phosphorus, which are two primary nutrients causing water quality problems in the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries. So this slide is provided by Dr. Mark Ryder. He is an agronomist who specializes in fertility, and he's been working to determine whether or not the poultry litter ash and biochar co-products from these systems can be appropriate, are appropriate to use as a fertilizer, and specifically whether or not they can compete with commercial fertilizers like triple superphosphate, superphosphate, and muriate of potash. This slide um, gives you an idea of what the typical fertilizer label would be um, for these products. Um, fresh poultry litter, 332, it's relatively low concentration. Biochar is also relatively low in nutrient concentration. Um, it's a lower temperature, zero oxygen process. So you still have a lot of carbon in the material, so you don't get as much concentration of the nutrients. The ashes are coming in um, ranging from 0, 10, 10 to 0, 20, 20. And that's depending on the feedstock. Of course, the um, litter that is, is older, where more flocks have been grown on it, has a higher nutrient concentration than litter that is fresher. So Mark has been using these ash and biochar products in field trials. He looked at um, corn and using these as a replacement for commercial phosphorus. And he looked at um, soybeans and using them as a replacement for muriate of potash. And he also compared it with um, poultry litter. And his conclusions from these field trials are that this material is a good fertilizer and it does compete well with commercial phosphorus and potash. And just based on a theoretical retail value of fertilizer over the last five years, um, this slide shows you what the approximate value on a per ton basis for these materials would be. Um, you'll notice that on the bottom of the slide there it has PL for poultry litter, which is in theory worth somewhere around $90 a ton. None of our growers in the Chesapeake Bay region are getting $90 a ton. Um, the market's pretty saturated where poultry is grown, and um, growers are, are, crop growers are just not interested in paying that much. The most really anyone is getting is probably $20, and many growers give poultry litter away um, if folks are willing to come and clean out the houses in, in exchange. We did have a grower who established a relationship and partnership with the technology vendor with Minnesota soybean growers. Um, and they tried to ask, they liked it, and they were willing to purchase it at market rates. Um, and that transaction netted that farmer more money than he would have got for those nutrients than selling them locally. So the concept here is to ship back the nutrients um, to crop production, big crop production areas that use a lot of commercial fertilizer. This is um, Mark's estimate of the theoretical transport range for raw poultry litter. Um, in theory, it's not really transported that far. It's produced in concentrated areas and generally also used in those local areas. Um, and this is a conservative estimate of the range that the ash co-products could be transported, um, taking into account shipping costs, um, spreading costs, as well as the granulation. So this in theory, um, that ash product really gives our growers a bump in the end, number of end users that they can market their product to. Mark did note that um, the material is very fine and dry, and that spreading it generates a lot of dust. So he did a lot of work on granulation strategies to um, determine the best approach for refining that product to make it easier for growers to apply. Um, the Minnesota soybean grower did not want any granulation because it does increase the price of the material. I mean, they used a moisture water spray to keep the dust down. But dust would be an issue for untreated ash or biochar products. So Mark's conclusion is that poultry litter ash does have real fertilizer value. Um, it's dependent on how many flocks have been raised on the litter. Um, it may need to be reformulated so that it facilitates the sale of the transport and spreading. He also looked at trace metals in the ash and compared that to regulatory limits that states set on contaminants that can be in fertilizer. And the metals were well within those traditional fertilizer ranges. And based on his work, he concludes that this material, based on the nutrient value alone, we can cost-effectively transport it out of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So I want to talk a little bit about nitrogen and phosphorus loss. That was a big issue for our project. 
as you can imagine. Um, so here I'm, I'm comparing reactive nitrogen and air emissions um, using preliminary emissions data. We've still got emissions data coming in or planning on doing more. Um, looking at thermal manure to energy technologies versus land application of untreated litter. Um, and we assumed that we were talking about 500 tons a year per litter of lit poultry litter. And just to be clear, not all our farmers are using that much poultry litter in their systems. We just wanted to get a good round number so we could make these comparisons. Um, the two bars on the left represent a lower and a higher range of, not, of reactive nitrogen emissions that we've seen in these, from these systems. Um, I'm specifically referring to NOx and ammonia. Much, most of, over, well over 90%, and in some cases over 99% of the nitrogen, the reactive nitrogen in poultry litter is converted to non-reactive nitrogen, or N2, in the thermal processes. Um, but still, NOx and ammonia are both air pollutants and water pollutants, so we wanted to pay particular attention to them. Um, and on the three bars on the right are potential ammonia emissions that you might expect from land application of that same amount of litter. And the three bars are different because they re reflect different approaches for land application. The lowest emissions come from subsurface injection. It's not common, but there is a group of agronomists in partnership with National Fish and Wildlife Foundation with CIG funding looking to develop develop a subsurface poultry litter injector. So that's possible in the future that we could get emissions that low for land application of poultry litter. Um, the next step is immediate incorporation. Um, and then, of course, the highest ammonia emissions potential comes from surface land application. This next slide, um, I'm comparing apples and oranges here. I'll just be very clear about that. Again, we're looking at the reactive nitrogen, the NOx and ammonia, and various North energy technologies. And I'm comparing that to an estimate for nitrogen loss to surface waters if that same 500 tons were land applied. And here we picked the Lancaster County area of Pennsylvania. And we used the Chesapeake Bay uh, Chesapeake Assessment Scenario Tool. It's a suite of modeling tools that states are using to calculate their progress towards meeting the total maximum daily load goals. Um, and so this was an estimate of the potential nitrogen loss to were both edge of stream and delivered to the Chesapeake Bay that we would get from applying that same amount of poultry litter. And we did the same analysis for phosphorus. Um, there is some air emissions in uh, phosphorus air emissions from these systems, probably associated with particulate matter. So um, depending on particulate matter emissions, there could be phosphorus. So, um, and again, we're looking at potential edge of stream loads um, and delivered loads for if that same 500 tons were landed wide. 